Oh, sorry, somebody say you can't hear nothing. I had muted, sorry, I didn't know that it mute itself when it got off. So I was giving the strategies that you want to employ from communication, other than the communication, you want also to make sure that uh, you reward employees for the job that they do, that they are involved. So you reward them. There is an aspect of uh, you want to build teams, encourage employees to feel motivated. They are part of the process. They are part of the team. They identify with the organization and whatever initiatives you are rolling out for the success of the team. You also want to make sure uh, you give feedback on what is being done. You generally give feedback so that employees feel part and parcel. Whatever suggestions they gave, if they are not working, you introduce new ones so that you improve for the betterment and employees feel part of what initiate whatever initiatives you are uh, rolling out. Question two. Question two. A, read. Who will read for us question two, A? Eh? I can read. Yes, go ahead. Two, question two, A. Eh? The management of Net Netlink Publishing Company Limited has implemented a strategic plan for the company. Specify any five tools that may have been used in developing the strategic plan. Uh, the management of Netlink Publication Company, Publishing Company Limited has implemented a strategic plan for the company. Specify any five tools that may have been used in developing the strategic plan. A strategic plan. You want to use a strategic plan so that you set out what strategies your organization will be pursuing over the next few years, usually three to five year period. Of course, they are long term strategic plans. When you look at, say, uh, the Vision 2030, is a country strategic plan once a middle income economy by the year 2030. So what are some of the tools that you want to use when you are developing a strategic plan? Yes, anybody? Have the mission and vision and mission in place. Have the mission and vision. Be clear as to the vision of the company, where you want your company to go. What do you want to pursue as a company? We call that vision, visioning as to where you want the company to go going forward. Yes, another tool you want to use? Strategic planning. What are some of the tools that are used? Have the objectives. Sorry, it's gone. Have clear objectives. There has to be clarity of the objectives that you are trying to pursue. Clarity as to what are the key objectives that you will be pursuing as an organization over the strategic period. Is it five years? Is it three years? There has to be 
strategies on what will take you there. Yes? Another tool? Can we say you're supposed to do a SWOT analysis for the company? That is the strength analysis. The yeah. first thing you need to do is a SWOT analysis of your company so that you understand your company, the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, the threats. Once you do that, then you can begin to talk strategy. But if you don't know your strengths, you don't know your weaknesses, you don't know what opportunities and threats you encounter in your market, then you cannot begin to talk strategy so this one of the tools you will use what analysis anything else two you will set clear vision so that there's clarity the vision of the company where it is going from there, you will have the mission to help you actualize and attain the vision. You will have a, to carry out a pastel analysis where you will look at the external environment, the political, the economic, the social cultural, the technological, the ecological, and the legal environment in which you operate. Then you formulate your strategy with this in mind. There is the Porter Five Forces uh, that we discussed in another paper. Is it last, the last paper of the week before? We discussed Porter Five Forces that you use as a company to formulate your strategy. Where in the Five Forces we say that as a company you formulate your strategy being cognizant on one, what is the nature of the competition that you're encountering in your industry because you will be acting and responding depending on the competition. You will be looking at number two, the industry itself. What are what is, what you, the level of threat that you face with respect to entry of new players into the industry? That an industry where there is ease in terms of entry of new players, then is more dynamic and as a company you will formulate your strategies with that in mind that you'll be encountering new players new challenges for forced to the company by the new entrants you look at your suppliers what is the level of power that the suppliers have to impact and make make decisions that will impact on the operations of your company you formulate strategy with that in mind under the one of the forces under the Porter five forces then there is a power of the customs there are certain industries where you have or maybe one or two main consumers of the products you are producing as a company you therefore have to coil your tail anytime the, that of such a customer so you must be clear what kind of power does the customer have in your industry and listen to their customer their demands their needs at all times when you are formulating your strategies you have that in mind you have the threat of substitute commodity so in your industry to what extent can we say that there is a substitute commodities can be in the industry can come in and you look at the mobile phone you will buy a mobile phone handset in a safaricom shop they charge twenty thousand same handset you go somewhere down lupuli you will get it for 10. but when you try using that one from lupuli you realize it's a counterfeit it's a fake one it's not the quality as the product you could have bought from a uh, Safaricom dealer registered shop. So the industry, one of the fifth force you have to look at 
what is the level of threat that uh, substitute commodities can be introduced into your industry. So the tools you are using, SWOT analysis, pastel analysis, then uh, there is a porter, five forces, then there is a visioning where you clearly lay out what is the vision of the company that you want to pursue so that there is clarity, everyone knows where the company is, where the company is going. Then you formulate goals derived from to help you actualize and attain the vision, the dream that the founders of the company say would have uh, uh, attained. Then there is the VRIO framework, where VRIO, we are looking at value, that when you are formulating your strategy, you want to be clear, are you adding value to the customer? That if you are adding value, you want to sustain that going forward, and that would be strategically beneficial to your company. But if you are not adding any value, then uh, you may not, in the long term, be competitive in your industry. VRIO talks about the uh, how rare is uh, the resource that you need to operate in your industry. Do you have any control over such a resource? That, for example, when uh, say an institution like uh, Kenya Water Institute is formulating their strategies on how they want to survive and excel in their industry, they look at their industry and they say, we are the sole industry the sole player in this industry with the mandate to help in training and developing capacity for the water sector. So they, they have some control in that, uh, maybe some legal framework or some technical know-how to be able to roll out training in that area. Not every other training institution can roll out the same. So they have some strategic advantage Maybe they have equipment that are required in such training. So such a rare resource that an organization can have can uh, bestow upon it certain strategic objectives that it will uh, consider when formulating its strategy. Then there is imitability. Is it easy that other players can come in and copy the products of the company that you are working on to the detriment of your company? Is it possible that you control the production processes, technology that is not easy for other players to help and produce similar or not? That also plays a part under the VRIO framework. Then what kind of organization do you have? What kind of systems are in place? Are you able to access the capital resources that are required to excel and to prosper and to expand and grow your business in your industry? These are some of the tools you use when you are developing strategic plans in the organization. SWOT analysis, pastel analysis, then we've talked about visioning of the company. We've talked about quarter five forces, and then the VRIO framework, where here we are looking at the value that you bring to the customer. We are looking at how rare is the skill or technology or the raw materials that you have. We are looking at imitability, the ease with which what you're dealing in as a company can easily be copied by others. That works against you. And then the organization that you're working with, that you want to formulate the strategy for. What kind of systems and programs does it have? And is it working or not? Question 2B. 
Question 2B. Read. Okay. Decision making is a daily activity undertaken by managers in an organization. Explain the decision making process. Read. Decision making is a daily activity undertaken by managers in an organization. Explain the decision making process. The essence of my insisting on your reading is as you reread, you internalize the question and you're able to isolate what exactly is the examiner talking about. So decision making is a daily activity undertaken by managers in an organization. Explain the decision making process. What comes to mind? Anybody? Decision making process. The process in which uh, a decision is to be made. Uh -huh. Like from uh, when, uh, uh, like when you decide, you decide from the decision of making a certain, internalizing it to make a certain decision in an organization. What is that process until you communicate the whole decision? Uh -huh. So it's a process. Process yes. means step by step what is to be done. So what is there in the decision-making process? Number one? Do you identify the decision you want to make? The decision around the problem that you want to address, around which you are making the decision. After identifying the decision or the issue, the challenge that you want to make a decision on, number two? Uh, is it? It's not only you. we are all, all all should participate. The, the level at which you make the decision is it tactical? Is it uh, at what point am I going to make this decision? In the level the at which we'll be making the decision. Anything else? Gather relevant information about the decision you want to make. Gather relevant information and facts about the decision you want to make. So that we normally talk of a manager should make informed decisions. You don't just make decisions for the sake. So need to have information. Next. After obtaining information. Yes, anybody else? Maybe you can seek alternative view. Maybe whatever you have uh, gathered, you may share it and uh, then you can be able to see if there's any alternative view or uh, people are for your view. So you will find there is almost always several ways of doing something. So you gather facts available and you start asking what are the options of solving these problems, these challenges that we are encountering. So gather all the alternatives or explore all the alternatives available for select for dealing with a given problem, a given challenge. After that, what else? You, after you've gathered and uh, the options and you weigh them, then you select amongst the alternatives available which one best suit solving the problem at hand, which one will work best. Then once that decision is taken, uh, once you choose among the options, then you need to implement 
take action. If it means firing some people, go ahead and do it. Take action. Making a decision. Then review and uh, evaluate the decision and its consequences thereafter. So what is the problem? Uh, gather all the relevant information and data about the problem at hand that you want to solve. Then identify what are the options you have in terms of solving this problem and evaluate and choose which option works best. Then after choosing the option that works best, take action by implementing whatever action you've opted for because it's based on facts you've determined which is the best alternative to explore. And then you have uh, reviewing the decision and uh, the impact on the consequences going forward. Decision making process. Question 3A, let us try to be a bit fast. Read. Ashron Properties Limited has designed a reward management system for use in the organization. Explain five aims of such a system. A system that you want to use to reward employees. What are the five aims of introducing a reward management system in an organization? Anybody? Five aims. Number one. I think it's a way of uh, motivating uh, the work, the team, the team. Contributing. To the work of the team, of the team. Next. To encourage uh, greater productivity. Encourage greater productivity. Next. Retain employees. Reward systems. Several. There are many reasons why an organization may introduce a reward management system. You want to encourage productivity. Use reward. You will set targets and tell employees we will be paying you based on how you will have performed. So you will get high levels of performance. You want to change or improve the culture in the organization, link the change to reward your life you to attain. You want to motivate staff and enhance their commitment levels, rewards will help you achieve that. You want to attract and retain the best talent to your organization, reward will help you achieve that. You want to build teamwork in the organization, reward will help you achieve that. You want to ensure fairness and equity in terms of the management of the reward systems in the organization. The reward management system helps us achieve equity and fairness. So we talk about equal pay for work of equal value. So several reasons why you want to introduce a reward management system. Question 3B. Span of control is an important feature in management. Span of control is an important feature in management. Describe five factors that may influence span of control in an organization. Anybody to attempt? The type of organization structure. If it is at all organization structure or a flat one? Whether it is at all 
structure or a flat structure in the organization. Anything else? Can we say the type of people maybe who are, uh, who are being uh, controlled or people who are being supervised? Because uh, like, uh, if you are supervising, like, um, for instance, the cashews or the manual workers, you need mm -hmm. a smaller span of control. Mm -hmm. So if you have so many people that you want to supervise, you need a smaller span of control. Anybody else? Maybe the geographical location. Mm -hmm. Expound. Uh, let's say an organization which is um, as uh, different branches in different countries. Mm -hmm. so. Span of control. We are looking at as a manager, how many people are you able to oversee, to supervise when they are executing their job mandate. So that span of control will be affected by several factors. You look at the supervisors themselves or the officers that you are working with within your organization. Are they people who are capable, who are efficient at what they are doing? Because if you have a strong team of competent people, then you know that as a supervisor, everyone is competent and is efficient at what they do, so you can supervise more people. But if they are less efficient and less competent, you realize there will be need for very close supervision, so your span of control may be narrow. You look at the nature of work. There are certain jobs that are very complicated and call for close supervision. It may not be possible for one supervisor to have control over so many people and the converse is true for less complicated uh, jobs. You'd want to look at uh, the ability of uh, the subordinates themselves. Competent people, then you give them work they do, so your span of control can be higher. You want to look at the organization structure itself. What kind of structure do we have? And what is the level of decentralization that the structure has provided so that ma managers are able to supervise people without being overburdened by how many people they can effectively supervise. Span of control, you'll also want to look at uh, the enterprise itself. What kind of uh, system do we have in the organization, the managers, stability in the organization, that a stable organization with a working functional system, functional structure, then it's easier to have a manager overseeing so many people and things will work. But a less stable organization, an organization with a lot of instability, then it becomes difficult for a manager to have so many people to supervise because of uh, the kind of work and systems that are in place in the organization. Then you can also look at a factor like how much time is available for the supervisor to do their job, to finish what they're supposed to do and to supervise their subordinates that if you don't have time, you don't want a situation where you your job is waiting for you, but you still have to supervise other people. You decide, focus and do your best, otherwise go home, because you are derailing my effort. It's not like being your supervisor, that is the only job that I do. I do a lot more than just supervision. Question four. The managing director of Metin Company Limited emphasizes the importance of effective communication 
in the organization. Explain five reasons for such emphasis. The managing director of Metin Company Limited emphasizes the importance of effective communication in the organization. Explain five reasons for such emphasis. Importance of effective communication. Anyone to go first? Importance of effective communication. Stella? Yes, Mama. What are the importance of effective communication? It reduces conflict. Reduces? Conflict. Conflict. Seraphine. It brings about clarity, so there is no ambiguity. No ambiguity as to what is supposed to be done. Cyprus. Millicent? It leads to proper decision making. Proper decision making. Clarity in terms of communication. So when the organization communicates and the management in the organization communicates well, then there are benefits that will accrue to the organization. Several benefits will accrue. That is why you're being asked to uh, explain why the managing director is emphasizing the importance of effective communication. Uh, you are able to identify the needs of the stakeholders and respond to them immediately if there is effective communication. You are able, as a business, when there is effective communication, to have some consistency in terms of how communication flows in the organization, upwards or downwards, that the channel being employed it guarantees consistency throughout. You are able to ensure, number three, that because there is effective communication, things are working out that likely productivity will shoot up. You're able to make sure any problems and issues and challenges that arise are identified and addressed quickly so that problem solving becomes fast in the organization. You're able to ensure when there is need for the organization to make any decisions as a manager, you respond quickly and make decisions and there'll be the right decision for the betterment of the organization. An organization that communicates effectively, also you're able to enhance your image in your industry with the media. People know this organization and how it communicates. Clarity, effective communication. Bobby, a policy on ethical behavior plays an important role in any organization. A policy on ethical behavior plays an important role in any organization. Explain the importance of ethics to an organization. Victor? Importance of ethics to an organization. 
I would say a company with a, a good uh, platform and uh, ethics, uh, it helps in the in the in the in the market play field in terms of uh, the customers. Ethics, an ethical way of doing things. You do things in a manner that is above board. So what benefits will accrue to an organization when the organization, the ethics in the organization, there is ethics in the organization in the manner of how the organization does things. So a policy on ethical behavior plays an important role in any organization. Explain the importance of ethics to an organization. So we are looking at why ethics is important in the organization. A customer coming to your organization and know that this company does things in a manner that is above board. They have an ethical way of doing things. What happens to the confidence the customer has with the company? will go up because they know this company does things the right way. You will not go to buy something and then they have opened up and replaced some component four parts and given you some fake just so that you they make more money, but you have something that will cause problems going forward. I think there are less legal issues. You? Less legal issues. Mm -hmm. In terms of what? In terms of maybe customers suing the organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You do things in a manner that is above yeah, board. Why should I take you to court? There is no reason yeah. because you've done things in a manner that is above board. There is no reason for one to take you to court. Less legal issues. Anything else? Fair labor practices. Mm -hmm. Fair labor practices, the benefit of that. One of the benefits will be less legal issues when you have fair labor practices. Why should I take you to the Employment and Labor Relations Court when the organization has done everything in a manner that is above? above. You want also to look at the corporate image. An organization that has an ethical approach to how it does things, the image of the company in its industry goes up. This positive image of uh, the company with the other players in the industry, and that is to the benefit of the company. Also, uh, you look at uh, finances there will be a reduction or no financial losses emanating from unethical practices. Because at times you go to an organization, the employees are unethical in terms of how they do things. So they play their games. And uh, when the customer comes back to complain and uh, demands to see the manager, the manager is forced to apologize and uh, replace whatever products the customer was complaining about. In the process, there will be losses that the company would have suffered because of ethical or unethical practice. Also, the employees of the company themselves are affected. And with that, even the company has an employer of choice, who wants to go and work in such a company, that is renowned for having poor, poor labor practices and ethical behavior in terms of how they do things in the company. Therefore, ethical behavior is critical and organizations will benefit when you have posit, uh, uh, functional, positive, ethical behavior in the organization, then there are benefits. Image of the company will improve. So the clients and customers that we deal with will have confidence in the company and will trust in whatever you are dealing with and 
you would go to a company that does things in a manner that is above board. They may even be charging higher prices than what the competition will have, will charge, but you will trust in them. If you have confidence in them that they do things in a manner that is above board, that would impact on them in terms of trust of the customers. That is beneficial to the company. There is the aspect of uh, minimizing potential lawsuits from unethical behavior and practices. There is the aspect of financial losses that may arise if you adopt unethical behavior and practices. Also issues to do with uh, employees themselves. When the reputation of the company is damaged, then even attracting or retaining talent should not be easy. Look at some organizations. Employees adorn the corporate colors with pride. Whereas in other organizations, no one wants to be associated with the company and its colors. I'm not sure, uh, no offense, I'm not sure many people would uh, adorn the city, car, city council uniform with pride because the reputation may be of uh, those Ascaris and inspectors. You no, know, it's not exactly the best in the market. But I doubt if they'll have a challenge coming out as employees of NMS, because the image the public has of NMS is more efficient, more productive, service delivery. So even the employees themselves want to associate with NMS and maybe not city council as it was. Question number 5A. Stella, read for me. Who reads for me 5A? The management of Jill and Gillian Advocates intends to adopt the management by objective approach to achieve greater efficiency. Explain the challenges that it may encounter when implementing the approach. Read. Management of Jill and Gillian Advocates intends to adopt the management by objectives MBO approach to achieve greater efficiency. Explain the challenges that it may encounter when implementing the approach. What is MBO? The challenge is uh, resistance to change. Management by objective. So you want to introduce an MBO approach, but is likely to encounter challenges. So what are some of these challenges? that you may encounter. Anybody? Resistance to change. Resistance, Resistance to change. change. Expound briefly. Uh, you may find uh, people prefer not to get uh, involved in the MBO because it's going to measure their performance and it will keep them accountable to performance. So they resist that that uh, implementation. So there may be lack of uh, resistance to change from the players, from management, and even the subordinates that this new way of doing things may fix us. So you resist it. Anything else? Challenges in implementing MBO. Maybe you don't have a uh, support from the top management. Mm -hmm. So if anything you want to do in the organization, if there is no support from top management, you it is likely to fail. But if there is support from top management, then the probability of it succeeding is enhanced. Anything else? Maybe lack of um, capacity to implement lack of capacity to implement the MBO, you might need to first train and enhance the skills level so that everyone understands the system and how it operates. Lack of capacity, anything else?
So in a nutshell, those are some of the considerations in introducing an MBO. You'd want total support from top management so that they are part of the initiative. You'd want a system where you train employees, they have the skills, they're equipped, they understand how the system will work and operate. You'd want a situation where you have clarity in terms of what are the goals and objectives and how these goals and objectives are being set, everyone is clear on their contribution to the actualization of these goals and objectives. We'd also want a situation where uh, the system, you don't, just don't come up with a new system that does not fit in with what has been working in the organization. We'd want to integrate the system and the existing processes in a gradual manner so as to succeed, not just throwing it and saying from 1st January, this is what we'll be doing. And people are even not clear how it will be working. Also, there is the aspect of resistance to change and uh, resentful attitude from the mass of managers and even subordinates which may affect successful application or implementation of the management by objectives. Question B, 5B. Five B, someone to read. Uh, analyze the steps involved in uh, the delegation process. What is delegation? As a manager, you not do everything. A manager works through people, and a manager works through people through delegation or by delegating. So what is delegation? You are assigning your subordinates what to be done so that you are sharing some of the responsibilities. But even as you delegate, you make sure you still are overall accountable to, or accountable for the processes that you will have delegated. In case there is any problem, you will not run and say, oh, he's a subordinate who did not do what was expected of them. So what is the process of delegation? What do you want to consider when you're delegating? What are the tasks? that you want to delegate. So you must identify these tasks that you want to delegate and uh, clarify so that everyone, the persons you are delegating to are clear as to the tasks at hand. Number two, you want to identify the persons to whom you will be delegating because you don't delegate to anyone, to everybody. There are specific persons that you trust have the competence and capacity that if you delegate, they will deliver. Three, you want to make sure that the persons that you want to delegate to have an interest in that line. I even excited that, oh, the boss has entrusted me with this. Let me prove to them that I can deliver. Not you are delegating to somebody who is totally resentful and doesn't even feel why you are doing the delegation. They are negative. So you want somebody with a lot more positivity towards the delegation itself. You want a situation where uh, if there are any tasks to be performed, you clarify the tasks, the specific tasks that the persons to whom you will have delegated the functions are to oversee. Clarity on that is of essence. When you are delegating, you are not taking our, the, you cannot delegate uh, the authority so that you must still ensure that even as you delegate, you are, you delegated some responsibility, but authority 
and accountability. Uh, you delegate some responsibility, yes, some authority, yes, but you are still overall accountable. The other time I gave the example of the housewife and the housemaid. The house girl has been delegated the responsibility of making sure that meals are prepared for the family. But should there be a problem, the man of the house will not ask the house girl, he will ask the wife. Because even when you delegate, you are supposed to ensure the persons who you delegated perform their role. Their role is to, you are to supervise to make sure if it is cooking, they've cooked and cooked well. So even as you delegate, you are still accountable. That has to be clear when you are delegating. You must be clear of the time duration and time period within which uh, what is delegated, what is the deliverables, within what time frame. That has to be clear. You must show the people to whom you are delegating that you have confidence in them and their ability for them to even want to impress and prove that they can indeed deliver on the mandate you've entrusted them. Then you have a mechanism for monitoring and evaluating what is taking place. Don't wait until at the expiry of the period is when you are shocked that these people you delegated to have not been able to deliver. So have a mechanism for monitoring and getting feedback that things are working as intended. A good manager, when you are delegating, you must uh, give credit where it is due. If there are any contributions of the uh, subordinates that you delegated to, recognize that. Don't take the credit for the work of the others. When the MD is recognizing, hey, the HR team has done fantastic. As the HR manager, you don't take all the accolades. You say it is a team effort. Indeed, Madam Jen led us in this initiative, came up with this brilliant idea, and we are proud of her. So that it is not everything good is you, the manager, and all the uh, bad things you want to blame the persons to whom you will have delegated to. So these are some of the considerations when you are delegating, just to make sure get it then in the final analysis you get feedback you review what you delegated the objectives the task how they were performed and then that informs your decisions as to how you will delegate for the next period going forward a process several uh, activities and steps involved question 6a 6a read Outline the strategies that may be adopted by management to enhance employee motivation. Great. Outline the strategies that may be adopted by management to enhance employee motivation. You want a motivated workforce. What strategies can a management use to enhance employee motivation? Anybody? Uh, how about uh, team building? Expound. Uh, when employees are taking uh, for uh, team building, uh, at least they get to refresh and uh, bond outside the work office. Mm -hmm. At least uh, now when they get back to work, uh, there will be a difference in their performance. Yes, anything else? Enhancing employee motivation. Reward management scheme. Reward management scheme. Yeah, in the organization so that the employee can be motivated to work and perform. Okay, anything else? Involve them in decision making. Employee involvement in decision making. Anything else? 
have a training and development uh, being done in the organization. Training and development being done. Strategies that you want to employ to enhance motivation at the workplace. Reward, reward management. You have the reward management strategy. Anything else we've left out? Employee wellness programs. Employee wellness programs is about what? It's about uh, ensuring that uh, employee, managing employee well-being. So motivation is complex and uh, what motivates me will not necessarily motivate you. So you want a situation where you come up with a system that speaks to <coughs> the needs and aspiration of uh, all the employees of the organization so that everybody at least finds something in the organization. So a reward strategy where you reward the achievements and accomplishments of the employees. Relating to reward, you want to have a, an incentive scheme where you recognize employees for their achievements and successes. Three, a uh, strategy for training and uh, development of careers of uh, employees so that they can grow and better themselves in their line. For you want a situation where you involve employees in decision making so that you seek their views and input so that they become more creative and suggesting that which the organization can do to achieve uh, desired levels of performance. Then also you want to be able to manage stress at the workplace. Managing stress at the workplace will entail using breaks, leave. Sometimes you may notice an employee is not productive. You ask them, take some days off to cool down and come back. Such can help us motivate our employees. Then also you may want to give good feedback. And feedback should be as immediate as possible if you want it to be impactful. Feedback in terms of recognizing, in terms of praise, be as immediate as possible. Enhancing motivation. Then can you have a flexible approach? Flexibility. There are those organizations since COVID, people are still working from home. But they are thus uh, productive. Somebody was telling me that an employee of Safaricom, they're even doing much more in terms of the work they assigned to do much more from home than they used to from the office. So some flexibility help us in enhancing motivation. Yeah, yes, 6B, the last one. Explain the importance of information obtained from a performance appraisal exercise. We read. Explain the importance of information obtained from a performance appraisal exercise. Yes, anyone? the importance of information from a performance appraisal exercise. Yes, anybody? I think it would help with uh, coming up with the uh, training needs. You are able to identify training needs coming from the, how the employee maybe 
performed. You realize maybe there are certain weaknesses that training can help address certain skills deficiencies that training can help address. Yes, anybody else? Yeah, from the appraisal you can be able Sorry? You can be able to come up with uh, uh, some sanctions where employees maybe are not able to meet their targets well, and also reward system for those who have met their targets and maybe superseded them. So a rewarding system, which may be yeah. positive for those who meet targets or sanctions for those who struggle to meet their targets. Anything else that uh, the performance appraisal exercise will yield the information? What benefits? Performance appraisal. Can we say improvement of working conditions? Expand a bit. Uh, for instance, you find uh, at the start of uh, the year you set some targets and uh, your people have not been able to meet them due to ch challenges maybe which may be identified, like they were not provided with the right tools. So in the next one you can be able to improve their working conditions. So it can enhance the capacity of the organization to identify and know what you need to work on so as to improve the working conditions and environment. You are able to identify the high performers and the lower, perf weaker performers and see what you can do in terms of improving and uh, addressing the weak performers and rewarding the high performers. You look at performance appraisal, then they will give us uh, records. And these records will be useful for planning for the future, for setting goals and targets for the future, for both the employee and for the manager. When you have a performance appraisal system in place, then uh, you're able to clarify everyone, their role, their obligations, the tasks they are supposed to, to deliver. The key deliverables are clarified when you have a performance appraisal system and that works for the benefit of the organization. You use that information to set goals for the next period. So if an employee struggled to meet targets in 2020, when you are setting goals for 2021, you may even tone them down a bit because the goals that you've set may not be realistic or may be too simple. If somebody easily met by media, they've already met and surpassed their targets, you set them relatively more challenging goals for the subsequent. So that is it for, for this paper, unless there's any question or clarification on it.